Greetings and welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And today I'll be talking about book five of the elements. So let's begin. Now, you, if any of you are part of my subscriber list, you'll know that I've been covering the uh, first three books and I haven't actually done the fourth book, which I'll probably try to get around to sometime. However, I am convinced that the fifth book of the elements is the most important. And that is the one that I want to start covering with you right from the beginning, including all the definitions. Um, book five is not only the most difficult, but also the most important. So <clears throat> the very first definition seems like a circular definition. So what it says in English, uh, translation by Thomas Heath, is that a magnitude is part of another magnitude. That to me is self-referential, but I think I can explain that, which I'll try to do in a moment. The lesser of the greater when it measures the greater, or a greater magnitude which measures another magnitude, a lesser magnitude, the greater of the lesser, when parts of the greater measure the lesser. Now, uh, if any of you ever understood your division at school in your arithmetic classes, you'll know that when you measure one quantity with another, you're actually performing the process of division. So for example, if you have an eight foot long couch and you measure it with a measuring tape, which, has, which is calibrated in feet, then you'll see that when you use the tape and you arrive at eight feet, you've actually performed a division, okay? Because uh, you're saying how many times does one foot go into eight? And it goes eight times, right? So the lesser, which is one foot, measures the greater, which is eight feet, right? But uh, the eight feet can also measure the one foot. How's that? Well, if you divide the eight feet into eight equal parts, then you've got a measure of the one unit, don't you? Okay, so now the greater can measure either in whole or in equal parts of the greater. So the second part that I've just talked to you about is implied, but not actually stated in definition one. And of course, I'm showing you the ancient Greek, which is the first one, and the modern Greek. That's why I placed an MG. It's very difficult to understand either of them. So I'll just read the modern Greek and tell you literally what it means. Meros esti meiathos. That means part is magnitude of magnitudes, meiathos. Toelason, the minor of the major. Otan katametri tomizon, when it measures the major. <clears throat> so... It's kind of difficult to understand, but the word meiathos in Greek is a primitive definition, okay, denoting the concept of size, and it does so in a qualitative aspect rather than a quantitative aspect. So for this reason, it is not previously defined. I believe that in ancient Greece, I'm convinced that in ancient Greece, everybody knew what meiathos meant. Okay, it's, it's, it was almost as common as the word size is today. So what does this first definition tell us of book five? I think it tells us that there is no zero magnitude. Okay, so how do I arrive at that? Well, if any magnitude is part of another, then it cannot be zero because zero is not part of any other magnitude. In other words, zero cannot measure any other magnitude and no other magnitude can measure zero. That's the converse. So most of the propositions that follow in book five would not hold if any of the said magnitudes could be zero. In other words, that seemingly circular definition is not actually circular if you look at it this way. In fact, it's quite correct. It says that a magnitude cannot be zero. And of course, a magnitude being a primitive concept is equivalent to talking about size. In other words, it's a qualitative aspect rather than a quantitative one. So um, 
It was a very good thing that the ancient Greeks ignored zero because you would have had no arithmetic or algebra or algebra since book five lays the foundations of all the arithmetic operations, such as subtraction, addition, division, and multiplication in that precise order, okay? And the properties of arithmetic are transferred directly from geometry to algebra through the abstract unit in book seven and definition one. So um, Euclid might have written something like this instead of what he wrote. He could have written, magnitude is the name of a concept whose properties are defined by its boundaries. And in this case here, you don't have any apparently uh, circular definitions or anything that might uh, seem vague or confusing because magnitude is simply a concept. And uh, for example, if you have a given line that lies between any two points, it has a magnitude that's called distance. So, and distance is a property of its boundaries, of the line's boundaries, isn't it? Distance is a property of the line's boundaries. Uh, likewise, a surface has a magnitude called area, which is a property of its boundaries. And a solid, again, has uh, volume, a magnitude called volume, which is also a property of its boundaries. And so I'm not going to go into definition two today, but I'm going to leave, I'm going to stop here and do this definition. And maybe um, in the next video, I'll do definition two, or I'll uh, switch back and forth between book four and book five. But Book five is a lot more interesting because uh, book five is the most important book of all the elements. I hope you've enjoyed this little presentation and that you'll join me again soon. Um, this is a new calculus channel. Till next time, goodbye.